I'm gonna be completely honest here. I'm tired of being disrespected. So uh, there was no question I was gonna play this year. We are now the Las Vegas Raiders. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Vegas Nation Blitz. I am your host, Cassie Soto, alongside Raiders beat writer for the Las Vegas Review Journal, Vinny Bonsignor. Vinny, I want to start this week's episode off with the recent news that the Raiders have, in fact, released cornerback Prince Amukamara. Yeah, and, you know, they signed Prince in May uh, after drafting uh, Damon Arnett in the first round, 19th overall, and Amik Robertson later on in the fourth round. Uh, but they signed Prince in May just as kind of an insurance policy, just in case uh, the young cornerbacks weren't ready. Uh, and also understanding like, hey, without the benefit of a regular offseason, uh, it might be a, a little bit too much to bite off to ask Damon to, to be ready week one. But, you know, by all accounts and from day one, basically, of when we were the media were allowed in to, to start watching practice, uh, Damon Arnett caught my attention from the get-go, and uh, it's been that way ever since. He just has a swagger about him, a confidence level about him. It looks like he belongs, and it looks like he's comfortable uh, as one of the starting quarterbacks for the Raiders. So kudos to him for seemingly, anyway, I guess we'll officially find out when the depth chart gets released uh, next week. But it looks like he's won that job, uh, and, and good job on him to do that because there were some people that – you know, on draft night, we're wondering if the Raiders made a bit of a reach drafting Damon 19th overall. Uh, by all accounts, he's justified the pick thus far. All right. Well, great news there for Damon Arnett, the young rookie. Well, let's go ahead now and talk about an addition to the team, linebacker Raekwon McMillan. What can you tell us about him? Yeah, he's a uh, traditional kind of a run-stuffing uh, uh, linebacker, middle linebacker, a guy that's going to be an asset in the run game. Uh, he's probably a little bit vulnerable uh, when asked to defend uh, the pass, uh, but it doesn't look like, uh, especially in, with the way the Raiders run their 4-3 base defense, uh, which they're only in about 30% of the time, if that, uh, he's going to be off the field uh, in known passing situations. But in run, uh, in the run game, he's definitely an asset. He'll fit well alongside Corey Littleton and Nick Wachowski. Both of those guys are sideline to sideline uh, players. Uh, Corey's tremendous in pass coverage. Uh, uh, Nick does a little bit of both, um, but, but they're on the light, the light side. So I think the Raiders want them to add a little bit of beef, uh, a little bit of power uh, in their linebacker uh, crew, uh, crew, and that's exactly what they get uh, in Rick one. Well, the Raiders have until September 5th to finalize their roster, Vinny. So just take us through these next few days. What does it look like for John Gruden and Mike Mayock up until that uh, September 5th date? Well, and when we say September 5th, we're talking about Saturday at one o'clock. So it is fast uh, approaching. And, uh, you know, this is this is uh, trying times. And number one, I think the Raiders have done a really good job with their roster. So they're going to cut some guys that are pretty darn good football players. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those guys got picked up by other teams. Uh, keep in mind, the practice squad is, has been extended to 16 players. So uh, there's a lot of players right now um, that are on the Raiders that are, will get cut. They'll be around in the next day or so after that uh, on the practice squad. But as far as what's going on behind the scenes, it's meeting after meeting. Uh, guys are getting up and pounding on the uh, table to, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, you know, in an argument for the guys that they feel uh, should be on this team. You're going to have a lot of arguments. You're going to have a lot of emotion and passion. Uh, but somehow, some way, it's all going to come together. And by Saturday at 1 p.m., they're going to be down to their 53-man roster. Wow. Can't believe we got here. After all of this, this long right? summer, it's crazy to think that we are just a few days away from some real live football. Vinny, thank yes. you for the updates as always. Absolutely. Have a good one, Cassie. In other NFL news, Los Angeles Chargers safety Derwin James reportedly will miss the 2020 season after suffering a knee injury in training camp. Meanwhile, the Jacksonville Jaguars waived running back Leonard Fournette. Fournette scored 17 touchdowns in his three seasons with the Jags, and the NFL said it has taken over an investigation into allegations of sexual harassment at the Washington football team. Let's get a quick update now on Raiders social media from Las Vegas Review-Journal sports journalist Le'Andre Fox. Dre, what do you have for us this week? So on Twitter... There is a social account called Raiders Post who put together a collage of Raiders videos in the office format for the office intro. 
with that iconic dun 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 music going under it. We got to see a bunch of, you know, shots of John Gruden, Mark Davis, Mike Mayock, all of them. And the special cameo was from Brian Edwards, who was acting like a goofball and really caught the attention of one Hunter Renfro. <laughs> well, speaking of Raiders players acting a little silly, did punter A.J. Cole the other day get a little camera shy inside of Allegiant Stadium, Dre? Yeah, Cass. He had a post on Instagram of him and the special teamers looking up at the Jumbotron with a caption that said, hey, don't look now, but we're on the Jumbotron. Don't be nervous. And I think that just really speaks to how magnificent Allegiant Stadium is from the inside and how much the Raiders love to be there. Well, speaking of Allegiant Stadium, it looks like the site got a special flyover on Monday. Yeah, so the Thunderbirds came into town on Monday and it gave us a pretty neat flyover over Allegiant Stadium. That nice outside shot of them soaring over the completed stadium. Dre, thank you so much for the updates as always. Thanks, Cass. Fans, be sure to stay with us because I will be joined by Las Vegas Review Journal sports columnist Ed Graney. We'll be right back. wrote the poem, The Autumn Wind? Was it A, Robert Frost, B, Rudyard Kipling, C, Steve Sable, or D, Shel Silverstein? Get ready for every Raiders game with us. Vegas Nation Game Day will give you everything you need to know about each week's matchup. I'm excited. Vegas Nation Game Day, coming to you on Sunday, September 13th at 9 a.m. for the Raiders season opener versus the Panthers. All your listeners and followers, the best name of any podcast in the world is podcast. podcast. It doesn't make good television if they walk in the door and be like, no. no. <laughs> we believe we can make absinthe work. Whoa, I didn't order that. Did you just, yeah, did you, uh-huh. did you just say that? Tom Brady. And, and Tom Brady, he's a quarterback out of the, in the Boston area. I'm not sure who you're talking about. <laughs> Tom- <laughs> Welcome back to Vegas Nation Blitz. I am your host, Cassie Soto. Joining me for this week's interview segment is Las Vegas Review Journal sports columnist, Ed Graney. Ed, it is always great to have you on. How are you, Cassie? I am great. Thank you so much, Ed. Well, let's go ahead and get to it. We are less than two weeks away from the Raiders season opener versus the Carolina Panthers. You have been at just about every single practice. You've covered this team extensively. So I have to ask you, Ed, are the Raiders, in your opinion, ready to step on the field for week one and get a win? You know what? They better be. Uh, It's a big game for them. They're actually favored going to Carolina. They're not favored on the road very much. So a lot is expected in that first week. But yeah, I mean, look, it's going to be weird for every team in the NFL with COVID. We don't know how much each team has really hit. I don't think the Raiders have hit very much scrimmage-wise. They've kind of held guys up. Um, Is it going to be sloppy for every team? You know, when guys start getting hit 100 miles an hour. So it's just going to be really a mystery throughout the league in those first two weeks. But I think John Gruden's excited. It's his third year. I think all of his stuff is in now. They do have new faces, but a lot of the veterans can pick stuff up easy. So yeah, I mean, I think they're as ready as you can be in the world of COVID. And I don't think any of us knows that what, what that means until they get to Charlotte. Well, Ed, you mentioned the Panthers, so let's go ahead and dive in there. They have had a lot of turnover. Of course, we know this brand new head coach, new coaching staff. Cam Newen is out. Teddy Bridgewater is in. They lost six of their seven sack leaders from last season. Ed, we talk about how difficult it'll be for the Raiders because they do have a young team. But can the same be said now for the Panthers? You know what? It might be as difficult for the Raiders because the Raiders are going in, and I don't know if they know anything. Matt Rule is the coach. He comes from Baylor. What film do you watch on Matt Rule? Joe Brady's the LSU offensive coordinator has come over, really young guy in his low 30s. What film do you watch? I mean, do you watch a, a bunch of Joe Burrow from last year? Phil Snow's come from Baylor. Now, he's kind of the older guy. He's got 37 years of college experience. He's the defensive coordinator. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's as hard for the Raiders because you don't know what film to watch. You don't know what you're going to get into. I would assume if I'm Joe Brady, if you're not that good, throw Christian McCaffrey 100 screen passes and hope for the best. Uh, But you do have Teddy Bridgewater there. We know what he did in New Orleans. The issue with Carolina in recent years has been their offensive line. They couldn't hold up. They didn't even 
play really well in the Super Bowl when Cam brought them to the Super Bowl against Denver. So if they can't protect Teddy Bridgewater and the Raiders can get some kind of push, I think that's good news for the Raiders. Well, one more note on the Panthers here. It has been recently announced that no fans, Ed, will be allowed at Bank of America Stadium. We've been at Allegiant Stadium these past few weeks and have heard that fake crowd noise be pumped in. Granted, that's just for a practice, but how weird will it be come game day, season opener of the 2020 season with no fans? Really strange, really surreal. Who does it Who does it help? Probably helps the visiting team, right? I mean, you can pipe in noise, but guys know that's manufactured. They understand there's really not people there. So not just the Raiders, but all across the league. I think the visiting team, it helps more. You don't have the people screaming at you. I think the refs call a cleaner game. They're human like everyone. They will not have the crowd booing them. They'll just call what they see. The Raiders will not play in front of fans until they play Kansas City, I think, in week five. Now think about that. That's amazing to where they will not see fans until that Kansas City game. So, um, yeah, it's going to be surreal and weird being there. Um, and like you said, we've seen a legion. It's just been scrimmages, but you kind of get the sense of how surreal it's going to be. Yeah, well, let's get back to the Raiders now, Ed. We know that the team has until September 5th to make their final roster cuts. Again, you've been at practices. You've seen these guys firsthand. So who, in your opinion, Ed, let's start with the offense, has really made their 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 way, has paved a way to earn their role on this 53-man roster? Man, that's a good question. Look, earning the role and having it hand to them is kind of the same here. I'll say Henry Ruggs because he was always going to be the number one receiver. But I think they've loved what he's, they've seen in practice. Uh, they love his speed. He's worked as hard as anyone. And I think when a guy comes in and he's, you know, a first-round pick and how hard will he work, he knows he's going to play. He knows he's going to be the starter. They don't have that kind of speed. You kind of watch him in camp. And he's earned a spot that he was always going to have, if that makes sense, because of how hard he's worked, Carr, all these guys are saying, you know, how impressed they are with him. So on offense, I'm going to say Henry Ruggs. It sounds a little strange because he was going to be it anyway. But you still have to earn your place in this league. Well, same question on defense now, Ed. Who has earned that role? Damon Arnett. Um, Prince Makamura was waived, uh, and it's Damon Arnett. And here's a guy, picked 19th overall. What did everyone say when he got picked? Oh, that's a reach. That's a reach. Kind of what they said with Cleveland Furl. Damon Arnett's a reach. You can get him in the second or third round. Well, you know what? The kid came in and won the spot opposite of Trayvon Mullen. So he's a rookie corner, which there are going to be some weeks where you're going to see he's a rookie corner. It's it's one of the hardest positions to play in the NFL. You're going to see speed and guys and veterans who can run routes that you've never seen. But he earned his spot, and once they waived um, Prince of Makamura, you kind of understood that they like Damon Arnett a lot, and he'll start opposite Trayvon Mullen, who's a second-year guy, which means they're going to have a lot, you know, both young corners, but we'll see what happens. All right. Well, final one for you here, Ed. We mentioned it before. You and I have both been inside of Allegiant Stadium twice now for those Friday scrimmages that the Raiders have held. I need your opinion here. What are your thoughts on Allegiant Stadium, where the very first few to get in there can say firsthand what it's like? You're a sports columnist, so I know you've got an opinion on what it's like in there. I like the bottom part of it where you illegally walked us through because we were not supposed to be under there. So props to you for that. But I don't know what you're talking um, about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know what? I talked to you before, and I will say this. I will say this. I've gone from the bottom right to the press box. So I see like a level above. It does seem to me a lot like U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis, which I think is awesome. It's light in Allegiant. The flame is there. The light doors, much like in Minnesota. The first time I was in there, the first week, I'm like, it's beautiful. You know, I've kind of seen these. You and Adam Hill, our colleague, actually last week saw it from a lower level, from the field level, and you thought it was much better than you thought the first time. So I've got to go down there and see it from there. Look, it's a beautiful stadium. There's no question about that. We need to see when there's 60,000 people in there. That's when you get a real feel for a stadium. And sadly, uh, for the Raiders and really for the town, we won't see that till next year. All right, Ed. Well, thank you so much. As always, can't wait to illegally walk around the concourse Darn with right. you sometime you. soon. That was you. Thanks, Cassie. <laughs> Once again, that was Las Vegas Review Journal sports columnist Ed Graney. We are going to take a quick break, but we will be right back with more. The answer is C. Steve Sable, the co-founder of NFL Films, wrote the poem in 1974 for John Facenda to recite as part of a Raiders highlight reel. Fans liked it so much that it became the team's unofficial anthem. Welcome back to the Vegas Nation Blitz, everybody. It's your Vegas Nation podcast host, Heidi Fang, and I'm joined here with our NFL writer, Adam Hill. We're going to continue our breakdown of the AFC West, and today it stops with your Super Bowl champion, the Kansas City Chiefs. What do the Chiefs need to do to stay at the top of the AFC West? Is this their year to continue their dominance? If they had the kind of offseason that they expected, that they weren't kind of resting on their laurels and just celebrating a Super Bowl all year, 
then they're going to be a big favorite, and they should win this division. They're the most talented team in the division. Uh, they've got a lot of continuity, which is going to be very key in this 2020 season, uh, the way that everything played out. So I think that they are absolutely a favorite as long as they don't do anything to get in their own way. Right now, the key players on this team, especially when you look at the running backs, it's going to look a little bit different than it did last year. Is this going to be problematic for the Chiefs making that adjustment? They did have that the big loss in the offseason uh, when Damian Williams decided to opt out, but they just so happen to have taken a running back in the first round of the draft. Clyde edwards helaire steps in, a uh, rookie from LSU, unbelievably talented and I don't think there's much question about what he can do in terms of productivity on the field. What they need from him is pass protection. That's a big thing for rookies, especially with this offseason where they didn't really get in there. He needs to be able to pick up the blitz. If he can't, he's not going to be on the field and they're going to have to fill in with some other guys in terms of the running back position. But I think the key to the offense this year, how quickly can Hilaire pick up on how to pass protect in the NFL? How about that defense? Where are the keys there that need to stay in place for this whole machine to keep working and all the cogs in its place. People talk about how bad the Chiefs defense was for much of last year. That changed down the stretch. Actually, the first 10 games, they were one of the worst defenses in the league, all turned around late in the season. And that's really what helped them get to that Super Bowl championship. The, the defense was underrated. Uh, and a lot of that is Steve Spagnuolo. He's the key to their defense. I think as long as he continues to feel comfortable with that defense, they're going to be more than good enough to help that offense uh, and carry them to another title. Great stuff, Adam. We can't wait for the football season to start. So as we get started here with the NFL 2020 season coming up, we have a moment for you in history here where we talk about the poem that became the battle hymn of the Raider Nation. That would be the autumn wind in this moment in Raiders history. Autumn wind is a pirate, blustering in from sea. With a rollicking song, he sweeps along, swaggering boisterously. I know my voice cannot do justice to the opening lines of the poem, The Autumn Wind, that was voiced by John Facenda. It was a cadence so riveting that the Raiders adopted it as their theme song. The poem, which was written by NFL Films producer Steve Sable in 1974, would later become known as the Battle Hymn of the Raider Nation. It was first used in 1974 for the Raiders' official team yearbook film. The original poem, written by Mary Jane Carr, was adapted by Sable for the film. As the story goes, the first time that Raider owner and managing general partner Al Davis heard the song, he told NFL Films president at the time, Ed Sable, who's also Steve's father, that he loved it and that it epitomized everything that the Raiders stood for. The song is often heard booming through the speakers at the team's home games, at team events, and was also used in 2019 during the team's HBO Hard Knocks campaign. For that production, actor Lee Schreiber voiced over the lyrics. And that'll do it for this moment in Raiders history. We'll be back next week. Get ready for every Raiders game with us. Vegas Nation Game Day will give you everything you need to know about each week's matchup. I'm excited. Vegas Nation Game Day, coming to you on Sunday, September 13th at 9 a.m. for the Raiders season opener versus the Panthers. All your listeners and followers, the best name of any podcast in the world is podcast. podcast. It doesn't make good television if they walk in the door and be like, no. no. <laughs> we believe we can make absent work. Whoa, I didn't order that. Did you just, yeah, did you, uh -huh. did you just say that? Tom Brady. And, and Tom Brady, he's a quarterback in the, in the Boston area. I'm not sure who you're talking about. <laughs> Thanks for tuning back in to Vegas Nation Blitz. I'm your host, Cassie Soto, alongside Allegiant Stadium insider Mick Akers. Mick, we know if things were quote-unquote normal right now, there would have already been two games inside of Allegiant Stadium, a Raiders preseason game versus the Cardinals and UNLV's season opener versus Cal, but that, of course, has not been the case, Mick. Yeah, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, one of the landmark weekends in Las Vegas history, um, kicking off the $2 billion mm -hmm. Allegiant Stadium, but, you know, coronavirus still, you know, the pandemic still going, you know, has a pretty tight grip on the area, you know, so they're 
no games, obviously, um, you know, no fans at all. He's here for Raiders games. So, you know, supposed to be the first one against the Cardinals on the 27th uh, was supposed to, you know, kind of fitting opponent. They also have a, you know, a movable field tray at their stadium. So, you know, you know kind of bringing in, you know, some of the, the, the new with the old technology here, that would have been, you know, pretty cool uh, regional matchup, even though they're not any kind of conference foes or anything like that, but still nice for Arizona fans are nearby. They could have came by. So, and then of course, you know, V was supposed to, kick off the non uh, Sam Boyd stadium, uh, you know, campaign here against Cal, which was one of the marquee matchups, Pac-12, obviously. Uh, that was supposed to be on the 29th. So um, Cal even tweeted out on the 29th, wish we were here, and they had a picture of Allegiant Stadium. So obviously um, not just UNLV missing on it. Cal was also, you know, excited to play inside the stadium. So that's one of two Pac-12 matchups that got nixed because of the coronavirus, also with the September 12th matchup with Arizona State. So two big matchups, um, you know, off the schedule. So even if they do come back and play in, in the spring, which they're planning, those won't be on there. Well, we know those of games should have, of course, happened inside of Allegiant Stadium, but let's move outside the stadium now, Mick. We know that major construction has, of course, been done and completed there on the site. But can you please give us the update on that gigantic media mesh that is facing the I-15? Yeah, so, you know, that's like the last piece the fans have been waiting for. Um, they're still doing some finishing touches on that. Obviously, no rush right now. There's, even you know, there's no events inside the stadium. So um, I, I'm sure they're just taking their time, you know, make sure everything's good before they, they wrap it up. There's a few spaces open where they're doing some wiring work, um, some finishing touches. So now that's supposed to be tested out in the middle of September. Um, so maybe coincided with the kickoff of the NFL season. Maybe that, that can be something with that or something. Um, so, yeah, so obviously no rush, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be a let up soon. And once it is, it's going to be, you know, one of the, uh, you know, jewels of the outside of the stadium. It's just that massive media mesh facing I-15 in the strip. Well, final one for you here, Mick. Let's take a second and go ahead and shout out all of your hard work as well as the hard work, the time and effort of a few Review Journal staffers. Um, a beautiful online presentation has been put together at ReviewJournal.com solely focused on Allegiant Stadium. Can you please just tell fans all about this? Yeah, so it's supposed to be, you know, kind of with the opening of the stadium, we're going to, you know, break down everything from the history of how the stadium came about tells you about all the features from the field tray to the, the Al Davis Memorial Torch, um, how the stadium's laid out and all that, um, has all kinds of different kinds of fun little features and facts that, you know, if some Raiders fans and, you know, even just fans of the, of the NFL or in the stadiums, you know, will, will find enjoyable. Um, we have an online presentation with, you know, some interactive um, features, um, some rendering videos that were put together that were spectacular of the the torch, you know, it looks, you know, pretty real. It gives you a, a sense of, you know, how many, you know, portions of the statement spans, how large it is, and it has like a flame go. And it's, it's really awesome. And also we had a insert in um, last Sunday's newspaper with all those features, 24 pages long. And if you're not a Las Vegas resident, you can also buy that online at the Review Journal store as well. All right, Mick. Well, thank you so much, as always, for all of your hard work. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Cassie. Appreciate it. That'll do it for another episode of Vegas Nation Blitz, but be sure to head on over to ReviewJournal.com to check out that Allegiant Stadium Field of Dreams presentation. It is full of great stuff about the stadium. For our Vegas Nation crew, I'm Cassie Soto. Until next week.